Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. guys welcome to friends in fiction we are so excited that you're here for our show and we have so much to look forward to tonight i'm christy woodson harvey i'm patty callahan henry i'm mary Kay andrews i'm Kristen harmel and this is friends in fiction new york times best-selling authors endless stories to support independent bookstores tonight you are going to meet megan abbott and laura lipman and we'll talk about megan's new book the turnout which was the august read with jenna pick and Laura's new novel, Dream Girl, which people called funny and suspenseful with a dreadworthy final twist. <laughs> people and which also, so got, and which also got a Stephen King blurb. Can I just yes. say that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 When, pe when people ask me one of my favorite authors and I say Stephen King, they're always like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Anyway, in our continuing support of independent bookstores tonight, our bookstore of the week is Square Books, located in Oxford, Mississippi, and we will tell you more about them in a bit. And you all know that every week we partner with Parade Magazine Online. We stream from their Facebook page, and we have an original essay in their online magazine every week. So this week, Mary Kay wrote about how opposites attract and how, in her case, she is 44 years into a marriage with her perfect opposite. You can find <laughs> it linked on our Facebook page and on, in our Instagram bio. But meanwhile, Mary Kay, can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, what I can really tell you is I did not run it past him before I wrote it. <laughs> and um, before it went true live. To true to form. <laughs> true to form. Uh, because censorship. <laughs> you know, um, unfortunately, we're notorious amongst our friends. We're sort of the battling Vickersons because, um, you know, when we have a difference of opinion, we, we kind of air it out. <laughs> But we're still here, and he just, uh, he's my wine steward on Wednesday nights. It's important. It's important yeah. to have that. Mm -hmm. He, among the many, many, many services he provides, <laughs> wine stewardship. <laughs> wine stewardship is one of them. How about you, ladies? <laughs> Are you asking what services our husbands no. <laughs> I, I, I haven't had enough wine. That's too so much information. It's a different show. That is an I, entirely I, different show. I knew when we were backstage that tonight was only going to go one way. He was going to take all the wrong turns. <laughs> um my goodness. Um, well, yes, Jace, Jason and I are opposites in a lot of ways, too. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I do actually think that's one of the things that makes it work. It, it, I, I was I found your essay really interesting, um, Kathy, Mary Kay, because, um, yeah, I, 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 I had a, I, I could see a lot of us in that, too. And a lot of the reason why relationships can work long term when you complement each other in a really nice mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Or when you're, or when you're apart a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. true. Yeah, that's yeah. true too. Yeah. But as we all noted in our group text, one of your best lines was, "He likes anchovies, <laughs> and I'm not a sociopath." So <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was my favorite line as well. <laughs> Words to live by, right there. <laughs> but you and I were together when you were writing this essay mm -hmm. and we had this conversation about, is it true that opposites attract? Does it help if you compliment each other? And I got to thinking later about how, when we, when Pat and I got married, I didn't think we were opposites. I thought, Oh, we just love all the same things and have all the same friends. And as time goes on, you yeah. realize 
Oh yeah, no, that was just a projection because you were yeah, falling in love. That's a so, good point. Yeah. yeah. I loved the idea um, of how you said that you sort of think everything's a first draft. Like that's how you kind of yes. your approach to life where Tom is very, you know, um, and that really struck me because I think, I mean, I met Will when I was 20. So, wow. I mean, you know, he's a lot older than I am, but I was 20 when I met him. And so I've changed a lot um, as has he, I mean, you know, we've both changed a lot, but I think it's really interesting because like, as we've changed, we've sort of, gotten closer. I don't know. It's kind of a weird because sometimes yep. you think changing can be a bad thing in your relationship. But um, but I think for us, it's been really, really good. So um, I liked that idea of how we're kind of always editing and, you know, yeah. our life is always changing. So yeah, yeah I think the your marriage is never as strong as it is when you're hanging pictures together. That's true. That is the true <laughs> test. Um, well, I will I don't say, do that though anymore. It, it's, so it, it's 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 a recipe for a bad marriage. Or putting like. together a piece of furniture. Yeah. So, no. Will and I. I like, Good luck. Do it yourself. Yep. Mm -hmm. Will and I went on a boat in the BBIs for our honeymoon, and he has his captain's license. I was not, and we didn't want to have a captain on the boat with us. So he was like, "Well, I'm going to captain the boat," but that meant I had to be his first mate. So the fact that we, we got home, we were like, well, we survived that. Like we're awake through anything. We yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> yeah. We can't back out of the driveway without having a spirited <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, wait, I want to talk about how we have news, big news tonight. Oh. <laughs> and a trailer to share because Christy has her new Christmas in Peachtree Bluff trailer to share, right? I'm so excited. Let's do it. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh. Usually we get to see stuff ahead of time, but that was a first. That was yeah, awesome. It's hot off yeah. the press. Hot off the press. That was not pre-approved. It was yeah. not pre-approved. Or no, censored. It wasn't. it wasn't. Oh my gosh. I know. Well, um, thank you all for watching it. it um, I'm so excited about this book coming out. And if you've read any of my Peachtree Bluff series, it is the fourth in the series. But if you haven't, it reads just fine as a standalone novel. And it's um, about a trio of sisters and their mother and a big hurricane that... Um, which is, is very, um, unfortunately, very appropriate for right now, but a big hurricane that threatens their hometown and threatens to ruin the holiday season in the process. So I um, can't wait for it to release on October 26th. And um, thanks to all of you who have pre-ordered. You guys are amazing. And I really appreciate you all. So um, that was fun. And now let's talk about our incredible guests, Megan Abbott let's and do Laura it. Lippman. Well, Megan is a New York Times bestselling and Edgar winning author of several hit novels, including You Will Know Me, The Fever, and Give Me Your Hand. And we were all cheering so loud yeah. when the new book, um, when the new book, The um, Turnout, made the list. So, yay. We're so excited. Congratulations, yes, Megan. So well deserved. That's awesome. So, Megan has been one, has won. Or been nominated for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the CWA Steel Dagger, and the International Thriller Writers Award. She's also the co-creator, executive producer, and showrunner for Dare Me, which is a television series based upon her novel of the same name. She graduated from New York University with her PhD, which is what you get after your master's degree <laughs> in English and American literature and has taught at NYU, the New School University and the State University of New York. Her new book, The Turnout, came out in early August and was a read with Jenna book club pick and her first ever book to land on the New York Times bestseller list, awesome. which I, I was amazed. I thought, I yeah. mean, I thought the world knew about Megan. Yep. She's amazing. Can't you hear? Yeah. So, so Laura, yeah, you're absolutely right. So Laura Lippman, who I had the pleasure of um, hanging out with in Indianapolis a few years ago at their book and 
book and author luncheon. Um, she is the New York Times bestselling author of the Tess Monahan series and several standalone novels, including Lady in the Lake. Laura worked as a reporter for 20 years before leaving daily journalism in 2001. I think it was a good call. Her work has been, <laughs> because listen to all this, her work has won the Edgar, the Anthony, wow. the Agatha, the Seamus, the Nero Wolf, Gumshoe, and Barry Awards. Wow. wow. I know. Laura was the first genre writer recognized as author of the year by the Maryland Library Association. Well, if you've read her books, you might have gotten a hint that she grew up in Baltimore <laughs> and graduated from Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. Her new book, Dream Girl, came out in June of this year and centers around a novelist who's plagued by mysterious phone calls from a woman claiming to be the title character from his hit novel. So even wow. that concept just gives me- Give me like, chills. Some That's little author so, goosebumps so good. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. <laughs> All right, Sean, bring the ladies in. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hi. We are so glad that y'all are here. Thank you for joining us. It's um, so exciting to have you on the show. And we just yeah. wanted to start off really quickly to, um, just we were going to see if you would mind giving us um, the elevator pitches for your new book. So, Laura, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Well, I mean, you kind of did it for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I guess we sort of did, didn't we? No, which is great. I mean, a, a novelist is, it's, it's misery in a city mm. where, where nobody identifies himself as the writer's number one fan. The nurse in this book claims that she doesn't even read. And it's a story about a man who has to wonder, am I losing my mind? Are the drugs I'm taking for pain affecting me? Or am I being stalked and pranked by someone who actively hates me? And which of those would be the worst scenario? <laughs> so good. So That's good. diabolical. That's diabolical. It was, it, it was it was amazing. It was very page turning. And I was wondering those things right along with him for sure. It's like, what is happening here? And you really don't know, which is wonderful. Um, yeah. So Megan, what about you? Can you tell us about the turnout? Yes. Um, it's about two sisters who run a dance school that they inherited from their mother. Um, and they run it along with, uh, it's, her names are Dara and Marie, and they run it along with Dara's husband, Charlie. Um, and they they kind of raised each other. Um, the, they've sort of a, a very sort of close tr triad, and um, they're about to ramp up for their annual production of The Nutcracker, which if you know anything about ballet, that's what that's what keeps ballet schools, uh, keeps the line <laughs> ballet yeah. school. Um, so it's a very stressful time, and then they have um, a fire in, at the school, and they have to hire a contractor and this very charismatic um, man named Derek. Uh, they hire him to, to fix the problem quickly um, and efficiently with very little money. And of course he has, a, because it's a crime novel, he has a, a lot more up his sleeve than they anticipate and everything kind of explodes. <laughs> Not literally, but you, know, you get yeah. the idea. Well, it was um, fascinating. Fascinating novel. They both were wonderful. I get to go first to ask these questions, I think. <laughs> yes, you do. I don't, I don't know if it's because Laura and I have a history. <laughs> 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 but uh, I should say that Laura and I go back many, 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 many years, and we have some show tunes in, in hotel lobbies, and so a lot of fondness <laughs> there. So, Laura, what struck me about your male protagonist in Dream Girl is the idea that he seems to have about himself and really isn't it always about themselves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was it was my hope writing the book that even though we're inside Jerry's head and Jerry thinks very well of Jerry <laughs> and sees himself as a blameless person that the reader would realize very quickly that he's not a good person. Was, because, it, was, it was it was magical how you did it. I mean, it really well, thank was. you. I mean, you know, you, it's. I mean, but we all know this guy, right? We all know this yeah. guy. We all know 
Right. This is a man who's exactly my age, give or take. He's very self-satisfied. He has had a successful career. He's one of those people who believes that everything he's achieved is because of hard work and talent. And anything that hasn't gone his way is, is bad luck. But he doesn't credit good luck for anything. It's never occurred to him that it's an advantage to be a white cis male who went to Princeton. It's like, no, no, I worked hard. My family wasn't well to do. I deserve everything I've gotten and some things I haven't gotten. I mean, I don't know if it's explicitly a line in the book, but when I talk about Jerry, I'm like, this is a guy, he really expects the phone to ring in the middle of the night and to find out it's the Nobel committee on the other <laughs> end. Right. This is who he is. Right. And, um, He's very much a writer of my generation, Tail and Boomer, but he identifies with John Updike, Philip Roth, Saul Bellow. He's one of those, relative, relative to them, a younger writer who thinks he belongs with these more serious writers. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just, like I said, we all know this guy, even if we don't know him yeah, as a writer. Oh, yes. He's yeah. in every field. Well, He's we at know every him as a conference. writer. <laughs> we know every conference writer. at the bar explaining to some young woman how amazing he is. And well, I wanted and, to write about that guy. And he's usually the um, the headliner. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, yes. Almost yeah, always, exactly. Yeah, yes. he's almost always a headliner. You know, I was just thinking, Laura. We, I mean, we've had a spate of books in the in the past. I don't know how many years that are about writers. And I'm thinking about uh, wifey, right? The, uh, the wife. The, the wife. Uh, yeah, the wife, wife. The wife. Which is different from the wifey. You're right. The wife. <laughs> um, the plot. The plot. Yeah, the plot. Yeah, came out this yeah. Year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and obviously this goes back. I mean, misery was a real inspiration. Yeah. I, you know, I love Stephen King. It he meant, loves well, it meant a lot to me when he said he liked this book because as supportive as he's been and as wonderful as he's been, I don't know how I would feel about an homage to one of my books. Yeah. Oh, but so you, you, I was, you twisted this so many. Yeah. This is this is a this is total Laura Lipman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Laura Lipman stuff. It reminds me of when in the Lady in the Lake, when the cop climbs through that window, and I went, oh. Ugh! yeah. Oh, okay, that's so a nice a moment. Here. There's a question here for you somewhere. Okay, how did you get in his headspace? How did you get in Jerry's headspace? So this Other is than something hanging out in the hotel bars. <laughs> This is something that comes up a lot, and there are men in my life who don't like it when I say it this way, but um, the prey knows more about the predator than the predator knows about the prey. Oh, oh. Someone, someone type that uh, timestamp down. That's yeah. really Oh, my gosh. Right? Exactly. I got it. I got it. That was okay. brilliant. I mean, we, we've studied men more than – men have studied us toward a very specific purpose. Women study men – in order to, in many cases, avoid harm. Stay safe. And alive. And yes. stay alive, to, yep. to be safe, to, you know, so many women understand this social pact in which we have to maneuver around them to get what we want, mm -hmm. that we can't come at them straight, we can't say what we want, or we can't say exactly explicitly what we want. I mean, we just, we I, I've said it twice already, we all know this guy. We've yeah. dated him. We've been yeah. taught by him. We've worked with him. You know, you've maybe just sat next to him on a train. We and, fell for them. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yep, yep, that, that too. too. That well, too. anyway, I thought you did a great job of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Thank sure. You. Yeah. Yep. You, you snuck inside his head. Okay, Megan, I want to talk about the turnout. But we cannot talk about it without talking about ballet. Mm. I took ballet for about six months. My mom said I quit, but I have a feeling they told me to leave. But <laughs> I am, I am, it's not my thing. But ballet in this book, but it's, it's like a little girl's dream. The tutu, yes. the pink, the crown, the nutcracker, like you mentioned. And ballet in this book, is the dark and the light, the yin and the yang, the dream and the curse that the whole story is woven around. So first I wanna know why ballet? 
What about this art form led you to center the whole book around it and, it and its mysteries in many ways? Yeah, I think it's just what you said, those contradictions in it. Um, I think particularly that sort of, you know, so many young girls and, and women are drawn to it. And I think the contradictions, the light and the dark or the the sort of mask of the ballet dancer that's hiding yeah. all the exertion yeah. and the pain and the toll. Yeah. And I think, wow. you know, the reason we respond to that is because that's what being a woman is, right? That you're, yeah. you're wearing oh, this mask. Wow. Um, so I think, you know, I decided this after I wrote the book. I, instinctually, I knew I was interested in it. And then you sort of figure out why. But that, yeah. I really do think that was it for me, that you need to hide the toll, you need to hide the sweat, you need to hide how hard you're trying. Um, and, yeah. um, and make it all look easy. Did you dance? Was this a was this something that you instinctually knew would have these contradictions hidden inside of them? I knew it much more as, as someone who couldn't dance, which is always when you have yeah. someone this more clear-eyed view of it. Uh, yeah. I tend to be drawn to things I can't do, like, like gymnastics or cheerleading or, mm. or science or uh, so bad. Yeah, it's just a disaster. So I, you know, I think I managed a few months longer than you did, but not only because uh, I had more um, persistent parents <laughs> who were trying to get me to <laughs> stick it out and not quit anything. Um, but I, I just had no capacity to make my body do those things it, I, yeah. I never had that relationship to my body so so part of it is yeah having that outsider view that that is so good for a writer to have because you can have it's a graham green calls it the the chip of ice in your heart that you need to, to write oh. about something and you have to have a little bit of distance from it i think or it can be too hard well first of all graham green is one of my favorites and i've never heard that quote um oh. So that's awesome. I want to write that down. I really but like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that little chip in your heart so that you can see from a distance. But yes, ballet is very mythical. And sometimes we don't know why we wrote about something until hindsight, but that's fascinating. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, Laura, I think it's really fun that uh, we have Megan here who called your novel the sharpest, clearest eyed take on a Me Too reckoning yet. Um, and I was like, yes, that is, yes, that's it. Um, so I'm just really interested in how you came to this story. Did you think I'm going to write a Me Too novel or did you have an idea for a story and that just happened to be a part of it? What happened was, is at the end of, 2018 i've been watching some horror films that were very dependent on isolation yes and i wanted to see if i could play with that idea in a city but where people are not that isolated i just had this hunch that our lives have become such that we were more isolated than we knew and that if we were you know stranded you know with an injury we might find out how few friends we had. We might find out what it was like if we couldn't leave the house. Again, it was the end of 2018. I don't, I, I don't consider myself particularly prescient. I really just was interested. <laughs> I was interested well. in what would happen when kind of like all the noise goes away and you really mm -hmm. are just left with the people who truly care about you and will check in on you. And then I started writing and it was so obvious that this would have to be about this man's relationship with women. I mean, a woman's calling him on the phone and sending him letters and even showing up in his apartment in the middle of the night. You know, what? who is he and what has he done? I do think it would have been kind of boring if Jerry had been a conscious cad, if he was someone who you know, sort of knew he was Great. a little bit of a louse. In, instead, yeah. he's the opposite. He's someone who's been married three times and has had affairs with his assistant and still thinks of himself as like a really, really good guy. Like, no, I'm a good guy. I love my mom. I took good care of my mom. You know, he measures himself against the standard of his father. That's a really low bar because his, <laughs> his dad was a bigamist. So like... <laughs> You know, saying, well, I'm better than dad isn't really going to take him very far. And I, I've said this a lot in <laughs> interviews. I happen to think that people who define themselves as good are the most dangerous people around. Oh, my gosh. Yes. 
Ooh, so. that's interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wait, can't... that's making me rethink myself. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I mean, but you know what I mean? Where people who think they're beyond reproach who are like, yeah. I, mean, I yeah. think I'm a pretty nice person. And I'm willing to talk about it. Like, I am this great this or that. Yeah, that's I am. Like, that's a difference. Maybe yes. he says something yes. negative about me, but, like, he snowed me in the very beginning of that story. I was like, okay, yeah, like, this is a – and then it was like the little – the story started dropping, and it was like, oh, God, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> great. Wait, 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 what? You know, I mean, it was, yeah, there is a slow accrual of facts. Uh, there comes a point um, – there are two things in the story that I think are notable and that once you know these things, you cannot like Jerry. Um, and speaking in sort of spoiler couch language, there's a scene in a hotel room. Yeah. And at that moment, if you still think he is a good, you know, it's right. like, no, no. Right. But there's also a scene or a reveal fairly late in the book about something he did to one of his best friends from college yeah. who happens to be a man. And to me, that's kind of the moment where you're like, he he has, I mean, yeah. it's weird because he has done worse things. I mean, right. he's done something that is could is debatably criminal. Huh. But what he does to his oldest friend is so cruel and selfish and self interested that you're like, Ugh. I mean, I was. I was just like, yeah. oh, you're 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 yeah. you're beyond redemption. So true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We kind of find ourselves in those little moments, don't we? Like you, you, you're defined yeah. by those little decisions you make and those little things. It's yeah. interesting that when a man, when a man breaks the bro code, that is the yeah. point of no return. Yeah. I mean, I think I wanted it there for contrast because, you know, I always hope that I have male readers. <laughs> I think you do. Well, remember Ian oh, McEwen, yeah, definitely. Ian McEwen sure. tells this story about trying to give away novels in a park opposite his home and no men would take them. Men would not take free fiction. And Ian McEwen said, when women start, stop reading, the novel will die. So, you know, but wow. interesting. I, I think I was very conscious of the fact that uh, that there would be certain male readers who would actually be like, oh, see, what what Jerry do that was so bad? <laughs> like, oh, but that thing he did to Luke, that was bad. That was Luke, bad. Don't, don't yeah. screw over your bro. Yeah, that was yeah. bad. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so funny. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> Megan, sorry. I'm like still getting over a cold. Um, Megan, in addition to your amazing novels, I know you're also the co-creator, executive producer, and showrunner of Dare Me, which was based on your novel, um, which is so cool. I mean, my gosh, that's, I, I, you know, I've taken script writing classes. I've, write, I've written a couple of scripts. Like, that's something I dream of doing, and you've actually done it. That's amazing. I, 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 I stand in so much admiration of that. Can you talk a little bit about what parts of your TV world feed your novels and vice versa? And just a little bit about the experience of, of having the chance to have such a big hand in adapting your own book. I think that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I mean, honestly, it's one of those things where no one really tells you how hard it is. In yeah. advance, and then you're kind of, and you're sort of thrown into it stages. First, do you want to adapt your own book? And it's really just writing a, a script. And then, like, slowly it becomes, now we need to pitch it. And now you need to imagine this a series. And now you need, and, and then you get a green light. And then you have to make help make every decision down to the, the prop, down to the water bottles that the girls drink and wow. things like that. So you, so you sort of, it anyone told you that at the beginning you might say no, I can't do that but because it comes in these stages and because it's creatively so thrilling to have all these collaborators you know because novel writing is for the most part it's one of the reasons that these things are so wonderful because we're by ourselves so much of the time um, yeah. the, the, the TV is so um, um, collaborative and this sort of um, you know getting this sort of trying to get this boulder uphill and hopefully it's the same boulder um, but but I do try to turn that off when I go back to novels because it is so different and I would I would I would really hate to take the lessons learned from one to the other because they don't fit um, at all and I always worried about you know being one of those writers whose novels start to look like treatments for things yes. or you know oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that was, and, and that would be a bummer so I and now I'm going to quote someone else, but um, um, first Graham Greene now, but Paul Schrader, who's the 
movie director who's famous screenwriter who also is a film critic and they asked how you can do both those things and he talks about how you have the, he talks about the the creative part of him is being like the mother giving birth and the analytical <laughs> part of him is is the medical examiner so don't let that one in the room where that baby will die <laughs> i do think that's true there's parts of tv that, that. Requ that require you to be very analytical and distance yeah. them and and um and pitching things and trying to figure out how to sell things and, and you have yeah. to kind of turn that off when you're when you're writing yeah you, you do has it i'm just curious though having kind of attempted clearly not as successfully as you attempted some of that so far does it influence the way you think about what you're writing for the future not while you're sitting there drafting and creating the characters and all of that but are, are you thinking even in revisions or as you're sending it to your agent and your editor, are you thinking of ways it could be framed as a television show or are they really just completely separate? Because I, yeah. I have found myself thinking now as I write, okay, this element won't work on screen. This element will. So I'm just curious if that's changed the way you approach things at all. No, and I'll say only because I don't think you, I don't think I can. I, I, I you know, the visual part is a whole different experience, yeah. and sort of one of the one of the exciting parts of adapting is realizing I don't need this whole forty pages because one yeah. shot, is, yeah. one shot can achieve this thing. And so it, you're thinking much more visually. You're thinking, you know, much more about yeah. structure um, than than even the, you know, well, I don't know. I always think Laura would write great scripts because she yeah. had plots out her novels in the most ingenious way. Uh, mm. uh, I got to watch her do it in person <laughs> once. And I would do. You, oh yeah, okay, yeah. So a Venn diagram. We were at a <laughs> together yes. and during the event, she's doing a Venn di diagram. And I'm like, I, I, oh, I, God. Uh, yeah. yeah. I can't. I it's just amazing. saw her do it with uh, James M. Cain. I, I've seen her do it with other writers' books, mm -hmm. and I, so to me, I know that she would immediately nail it. But but for me, um, that that's a very very different. That's a very different thing. I could never think of those the yeah. the structure of TV when I'm writing a novel and vice versa. It's sort of the, the, the beauties of both are them being separate. But if I could do what Laura did, I would be I would be pitching shows all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. All right. So, are we going to take some live questions? Well, let's, you want to let everybody know about our bookstore of the week? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm supposed to tell you about the bookstore of the week, which is Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, known, and it's a place that's, you know, a place we all love, known for its strong selection of literary fiction and books on the American South and by Southern writers. The store hosts the popular Thacker Mountain radio show and more than 150 author events a year. And this week you can get 10% off these books, our books and Megan's and Laura's with code friendsfiction10, all one word. And, uh, and that includes a turnout by Megan and Dream Girl by Laura, as well as our new and recent titles from the Fab Five. Okay, now we get to do some live questions. I always love seeing what rolls in. So for the first one, this one is for Laura, and it is from YouTube because we're on YouTube and on Facebook. And this is hilarious. Yeah. Ellen Clark asks, Laura, speaking of Jerry, my cousin Jerry Berkowitz was your <laughs> teacher in high school. This sounds made up, but <laughs> did he did he have any influence on you becoming a novelist? That's so funny. Okay, so I have the worst memory in the world, but I actually know the name of every English teacher I had in high school, and I don't remember having Jerry Berkowitz as my teacher. And I'm, I'm like, I was like, I had Jan Salvati, I had Bonnie Daniel, I had Lillian Martin, I had Mr. Ark. And I'm sort of like, I'm really trying to like, was he in social studies? I mean, I do have this terrible memory, which is really a curse. So I'm guess I'm going to have to say no, because <laughs> it's certainly not. I mean, maybe subliminally, maybe subconsciously, and I'm yeah. feeling terrible because this is probably a wonderful person <laughs> who did teach me and was incredibly caring and supportive, and I've just gone blank on it. But yeah. I, I think maybe one of the 
weird things about being out in the world in a public way is that people begin to remember you in a way that you yeah, don't remember. remember. Yep. It's just, yep. um, mm -hmm. although there's always, I know that this is true somehow. I just don't know how. And my memory, I mean, part of the reason I wrote Dream Girl is because I sit around all the time worrying about my memory. Wor I worry about dementia all the time. Um, mm. The other day, there was this period of several hours where I could not remember the name of the actress, uh, Margot Robbie. And I was just like, this is it. I'm losing my mind. It's over. It's over. <laughs> I've that too, heard same. that if you can't remember Margot Robbie, I mean, that's it's over. <laughs> yeah. It's like the yeah. premiere test. Listen, Laura, I don't remember any yeah. of my high school teachers' names. I can't think of one right now. If you came up and said, you have to pick a high school teacher yeah. right now, I'd be like, there was that history teacher with the dark hair and no idea. You don't even know their first name. You're, they're only Mr. You know, it's yeah, Mr. Berkowitz. Well, but you know what? If Mr. Berkowitz had been a bad teacher, you would have remembered him That's for that. True. He was there obviously a good That's teacher true. because he didn't stand out and stick all these years later. Mm -hmm. Right. And, like, yeah. and now I want to go get my high school yearbook and like look yeah, at it and find Jerry yeah. Berkowitz. But I'm like remembering every other teacher. I'm like, and there was Ron Paradise. <laughs> there was, I mean, okay. I will well, tell you. That's a, that's a good character name right there. Ron my, Paradise. Yes. Yes. My chemistry teacher was named Pepe Sandoval. And he wow. actually came I can't to you a remember book signing. All this. He came to a book signing with his grade book to show me that I made oh strays in his class. I was oh like, my gosh, that's it's like, you're, you're a hoarder, dude. But I mean, it's very sweet. Oh, awesome. No, but that's yeah. the cool, that was one of my favorite things ever. I remember when my first book came out and a bunch of my teachers came to my first book signing and that just meant the world to me. It was like yeah. just one of the greatest things ever. Okay, um, Ellen is saying that Jerry taught at Wild Lake. Yeah, it's Wild Lake, that's where I went. And I'm still, you know, Ellen, I'm gonna do some research, I promise you, but I, I, um, I was at Wild Lake for only three years, for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. It was still open space education at the time. What I remember about Wild Lake is that it was so loose and so crazy that I was allowed to take one of my favorite novels, which is The Joyous Season by Patrick Dennis, best known for Auntie Mame, and oh. I was allowed to adapt it to write like the book for a musical with lyrics. And that was like a full quarter's work. You know, all I had to do was sit there every day and write this play. And it was oh, like, that's yeah, that's, yeah. Awesome. Wild Lake was- We want to see that. Very we cool. want to see I that. Know. No idea where it is. <laughs> all right, so now we have a live question for Megan. Um, out of all your novels, what, what do you think stood out? Sorry, this is from Diana Condor. Megan, out of all your novels, what do you think stood out in Dare Me that it was chosen for television? Boy, I, I, as as you probably all know, you know these things are in development for so long, and and there's several yeah. going at once sometimes, yeah. and you never know. Um, and that was seven years in development before it got wow. made. But wow! I, seven I years. Just, wow! Yeah, it started as a feature, and yeah, it changed. You know, it changed with everything that was changing in the move from movies yeah. to TV, and then TV to streaming. Um, but I think it was just the thing that made it hard to get the green light earlier. Made it. Um, made it more likely that we got it when we did, which is that it didn't fit in any of the boxes. And then that mm. suddenly became the thing they wanted was they wanted something that yeah. didn't fit in the boxes. The fact that it that. was teenagers and noir and it had adult characters and it had this cheer element, but it was, you know, a lot of inappropriate activities in it. And so all this sort of stuff that didn't land anywhere, I think made it, made it feel like, oh, this, this is, this is, this is what we need. We've never seen this before. So I think, uh, but I do think so much of that is, is, is luck and having people fighting for you in your corner, yeah. which, you know, you just don't always get. That's so true. So I have a question for both of you from um, Kathy Hamdi Swink. And this is really fascinating. How do you relate to your um, more, I mean, she says icky characters, but your your characters that we, I mean, in, in the books that you write, we have to hate your characters. There have, there, there's, there's, there's usually a villain of some sort. There's someone that we're supposed to not like. So how do you relate to them? Laura, do you want to start? Well, you know, first of all, I, I do teach. I teach creative writing um, primarily in a one-week conference at Eckerd College in oh, St. Petersburg. Right. Oh, I like and that. a lot of my students 
have been submitting manuscripts and they get them rejected. And sometimes they're told, well, this got rejected because there are no likable characters. Mm. And I'm like, no, no, no. I was like, this is just, this is like a guy telling, I mean, like someone saying to you, I don't want to go out with you this weekend because I have to wash my hair. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a thing people say, and we shouldn't attach that much meaning yes. to it because mm -hmm. obviously books with um, unlikable characters are fantastic. I mean, you know, let's, Vanity Fair, you know, it's like <laughs> Becky Sharp is not likable, but wait, yeah. you know, so what really matters is, is the character good company? Is the character charismatic? I mean, I think the example I like to give most often is Hannibal Lecter, who started as a very minor character in Thomas Harris's work and was brought to the forefront. And it works because he's interesting. You want to see what he's going to do next. You want to hear what he's going to say. You, you know he's horrible. Although on some level, you know, there's a part of us that are all like, yeah, if I could just kill everyone who ever irritated me, that would not be so bad. I don't know if I'd want to eat them. But so, I mean. No, me, I don't. To me, to write an, an icky character, you just have to kind of commit. You have to mm -hmm. commit to the character's sense of himself or herself. I mean, truthfully, I write Maddie in Lady in the Lake is horrible in sure. a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, you know, I kind of love her, but she's pretty cold hearted and she's really, you know, calculating. She, it's her, it's like, she's like, it's my career above everything else. And hell, it's 1966. What choice does a woman have? She's not going to, she's not going to have it all. She's going to have one thing. And she's like, I'm going to have a career and I'm going in pursuit of that. And in the end, I kind of admire her, even though she causes a lot of pain and, you know, she, she destroys lives yeah. still like her, but yeah, I think it's just about, I just commit, just commit to the character. Megan, what about you? Yeah, I feel the same way. I don't know. I love them all. I, <laughs> I always feel like okay. you should be, a, or at least for me, I don't, I, I, I love all kinds of sort of approaches to this. But for me, I feel like I have to be the advocate for all my characters <laughs> and, and the antagonist yeah. sort of. Um, and for the same reason Laura's saying, they're also thrilling to write. They're invigorating. They do whatever they want. They don't follow any of the rules. Um, and and they make things happen in the story. And so I just sort of go, go in hard on them. And, yeah. you know, the, I feel... I don't know that unlikable thing. I do think it's sort of it's done the most damage to writers if taking that to heart because mm -hmm. it is really oh, a wow. trick. It's a it's a real trick, and it doesn't mean what you think it means, and and it means you you might end up writing a, a boring book because you don't care because you mm -hmm. feel like whatever that idea of likable unlikable yeah. is. So mm -hmm. I feel like that would be something that I would say that if someone says that to you, there's something else going on, but it's not mm -hmm. that. Um, I said to someone one time about one of my characters, like, well, you know, we might have to water her down because she's, you know, or something like that. And and, um, and they said, you know, if no one hates your character, probably no one loves them either. And that's yes. sort of the trick. And I thought, wow, yes. that's a really interesting, you know, you do have to kind of bridge that gap because everyone, if you write all these really perfectly lovely characters, then it's nothing's not really happening in your book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. So even though I feel like we just got a master class in characterization, mm -hmm. I'm still going to ask our writing tip of the week because y'all are just this fount mm -hmm. of knowledge. So Laura, you want to give your writing my, tip? My number week? one writing tip is don't be precious. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, God, I love I, that. I, you know, this is something writing, is there talent involved? Sure. Is inspiration helpful? Yes. But it's kind of a job. It is a yes. job. And it's the one yeah. I show up for <laughs> almost every day. And I, I think a big part of this is, you know, I am out of journalism. I'm used to deadlines. I'm used to writing when I'm not inspired. I'm used to writing when I don't want to write at all. And I'm, I'm even used to writing about stuff that I never knew I was going to have to write about and researching things that I never thought I would have to know. Um, just show up, find a process that works for you, do the work, meet whatever quotas you set for yourself, whether it's time in chair, words on page. Um, and, and don't 
take the writing life as an excuse to become some eccentric weirdo who's like <laughs> wandering around the moors, like, you know, talking about your pain and your, your, your fragility and your sensitivity. And like, Laura, and don't mock muse. my process. That's my process. <laughs> <laughs> We'd all kind of been whining about something. I feel so seen. I whining is seen. fine. Whining is encouraged <laughs> over like, alcoholic I beverages know. with other writers. But I know seeing well, yourself this writer streak so much, like in history. You know? <laughs> I just seeing yourself as some really rarefied creature who's so tender. It's just that's really not going to serve the work that well. So again, I just boil it down to don't be precious. That is great it. advice. So great. I remember <laughs> once I went to a talk and and the 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 writer was talking about that exact same thing. And she goes, plumbers don't wake up and say, I'm not inspired to plumb today. <laughs> right. Like just get up and do your job. Okay, <laughs> Megan, I want to hear from you. Yeah, mine is a variation on that. It, it's really the same. I just putting it differently, which is right badly. Um, mm -hmm. I think we can get really depressed mm -hmm. when you know you're it's not going well and the sentences are barely coming out. It's because you're trying to make it good, you're trying to make this vision in your head sort of magically happen and um or like just sort of it's like this block of wood and suddenly it's supposed to be like a Michel michelangelo you know it just like yeah. just can say i'm going to write badly for the next hour or i'm going to write badly for five pages or whatever one page whatever it is and it it's amazing even if you get one good phrase out of that or just yeah, the sure. adrenaline of it yeah. or just the permission to to write stuff you wouldn't normally write so i think i mean for some people writing by hand a little bit does a similar kind of thing because you, you can't just yep. keep re-editing it and I think that that's always been helpful to me to remember is that this doesn't have to be good uh, I tell myself this will never end up in the book and maybe it will and maybe it won't but but it, it sort of just lets you free uh, to, to be be crazy and then go after we go out on the moors <laughs> <laughs> I would have praised Megan who's an, you know been my friend for a long time and I'm one of her biggest fans. And I think Megan has an elevated style that changes from book to book. Her style changes to fit the story, which I don't know many writers who are doing this. And I will say this, and I don't think Megan's ever heard me say this out loud, is sometimes when I'm in that third draft or fourth draft, and you know, you're trying to try to push it, and you're trying to just make it better like mm -hmm. how do i take the and i will think what would megan abbott do with this sentence oh, i really do oh, i love it's that absolutely true that's oh, incredible that's awesome. nice, nice. Nice. well what what wonderful tips and i will in the future be thinking what will megan abbott and megan abbott do as i'm revising mine that's wwmad <laughs> exactly we'll get bracelets made yeah. exactly exactly well ladies thank you so much for those wonderful writing tips we would love to hear if you have a book to recommend to we always love hearing your book recommendations megan do you have anything you'd like to recommend yes and i, I know this is one that, that that laura loves too but it's an upcoming book allison galen's the collective which is out mm -hmm. in november and i read it a few months ago in galley form and uh it and i would also say this if the less you could read about it in advance the better because okay. the, one of the beauties of galleys is you know we're very lucky to get them but you don't have any real flap copy of that yeah, can, yeah. you know so yeah. i read it without having any idea what it was about and the twists and turns and the um the weight of it and i don't want to say too much about it but it's it's just it's about a a, a grieving mother who's trying to find a way to process her grief but to me it's sort of up with the best of ira levin who i always think of one of the great thriller writers rosemary's baby and stepford wives to me it's like that it's it's awesome. um, a social thriller and you could not put it down and you cannot believe where she goes with it and earns it that's so awesome, awesome. Gonna read it. awesome. The collective okay Great. How about you, Laura? Do you have a book um, recommendation? I have a recommendation of a of a trilogy of memoirs that really were essential to me during this past year and a half. They're by Deborah Levy, who's a British writer, and they're these slender. They're memoirs. I don't think they're autofiction, and they're the first one is Things I Wish I Didn't Know. The um, second one is called The Cost of Living, and the third one is which just came out about two weeks ago is called Real Estate. And the okay. thing is, is these are very much about being a writer and a woman and figuring mm -hmm. out 
what that means. And like, sometimes she's just like, what is a woman? What does it mean to be a woman in the patriarchy? What is my role? I mean, it follows her as she leaves a marriage and makes a new home for herself. I've just started reading real estate where she becomes obsessed with finding a new home. She's just a beautiful, beautiful writer. And these books just feel extremely, I, I, they make me want to get up and go write again the next day. I mean, I feel very oh, seen to awesome. use the cliche. So that's incredible. Oh my gosh, that's the best kind of feeling to walk away from a book with. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for those recommendations. I also wanted to mention my little sister, Karen Cleveland, has a new book out um, this week. It's called You Can Run. Um, it's her third novel, and she used to be a CIA analyst. And the protagonist of this novel um, is a former CIA analyst, just like her. And there is another protagonist who's a Washington Post journalist. So um, it's about sort of this web of lies they get caught in, and it has to do with Syria. So it's very fast moving. It's very timely. You Can Run by Karen Cleveland. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I cannot Great. run. But I'm I not run either. No. Maybe that's what, yeah, that's why I'm so drawn to it. I'm like, yeah. I can run. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> I believe. I, I thought it was like a self-help like, training book. That could, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No. All right, Megan and Laura, please, and everybody else, please stick around because we want to have one more thing to talk about with you too. But first, we want to remind everybody watching about checking our Friends in Fiction Writers Block podcast. We'll always post the links under announcements each time a new one goes out. It's a lot of fun and it's totally different from this show. So if you like hanging out with us here and you love books, we know you'll love being with us there too every Friday. Last week, Ron Block and I talked to, and I know Laura loves this woman as much as I do, Virginia Stanley of Harper Collins and Nancy Pearl, Seattle uh, librarian rock star. And uh, then this week, Ron and Kristen talked to S.A. Crosby, Cosby, Cosby about his new novel, Razorblade Tears, which is just... Yes. But one, what did he win? Did he win? He won everything. He won the yeah. Anthony. He won the Bear. I mean, he's yeah. just. I think he won he's, LA Times. Do you win LA Times? Awesome. I believe so. Oh my gosh! I, I saw him win that Bear uh, Anthony Award Saturday night on live, and he gave. He, I it was the only time I cried on Zoom with him. He gave oh, such a beautiful wow. speech. It was so moving. Um, and he's a, he's a great writer, and, he's and also, as as you all have seen, I'm sure he's just a great social media presence. I love having him out there. Yeah. So he's, he's going to be talking to Ron yeah. and Kristen about his new novel, Razorblade Tears. On it, the podcast it's just, it was week. such a great chat. You know, he's so, he's so honest and so he's open good. about his journey. And I think mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was really an extraordinary, an extraordinary chat. I, I really hope you, you, uh, you tune in for that because I think so highly of S.A. Cosby. He's fantastic. So also our book club, you hear us talk about it every week. But if you are not hanging out with us yet in the Friends in Fiction official book club, what are you waiting for? Um, so the group, which is separate from us and is run by our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is way past 8,000 members now. They are closing in on 9,000, which is incredible. Um, and on September 20th, Patty is going to be joining them to discuss her novel, The Bookshop at Water's End. And they have a great schedule coming up. It's a great group. It's just another wonderful thing to be involved with if you like to read. And next week, next Wednesday at 7 p.m., our new guests will be Darren Kagan and Paula Ferris, who were both journalists and they moved to author and they both were on air and working during 9-11. So as we honor that, we will be talking to them about that and about their transition to being an author. Then in two weeks, join us as we welcome Emily Henry, who wrote the blockbuster new rom-com people we meet on vacation and if you're ever ever wondering about our schedule it is on our website and i also want to remind you if you don't have any yet we have some amazing friends in fiction merchandise available including a beautiful t-shirt a great wine sippy does anybody have their wine sippy tonight I don't. <laughs> and Sean does. Sean does. And a so does Mary Kay. coffee tumbler um, and more to come. So uh, look out for that. And in just a few minutes on our after show, we're going to be announcing this week's merch star. So you're not going to want to miss that. All right, MKA, you want to ask what am our I last question? About? 
are oh. very. <laughs> yeah. I am talking about the last question, right? Yes. Yes. yes thank you. <laughs> okay. Megan and Laura. I mean, I know a little bit about this because I've known Laura so long. But one of the questions we'd like to ask uh, of our authors is what were the values around reading and writing in your childhood? And I, I know some of these answers already, but I think our viewers always love them. So where, what happened to, oh, there you are, Megan. <laughs> I let Megan answer first. Yeah. yeah, boy, I, you know, it was a book lover's household. It was a house full of books and uh, my parents were both, you know, insatiable readers and my brother too. And, you know, we used to go to the library every week, sometimes twice a week and get to check out as many books as we wanted mm. and uh, got to get the um, adult books earlier than other kids because of my, our, my parents would make the case for us. So it was it was always really the center of things for me. It was hard to, hard. we never did anything else really because we never went camping. We never did <laughs> any of the usual family stuff. We usually just would pack a bunch of books. And um, oh, wow. yeah, so it was always sort of fundamental. Hmm. That's amazing. That's awesome. At, Laura, you're, wasn't your mom a, a librarian? Do I have that right? Yeah, she became a librarian when I was already in fifth grade. That's when she went back to school. And so I wow. actually read through the Newberry books with my mom. I'm always like, I'm oh one of the few people. I'm one of the few people who's read Gay Neck: The Story of a Pigeon, which won the Newberry like back in the 1920s or 30s. Um, but reading because I was the youngest of two, I saw it as the path to adulthood. And I think a lot about the fact, yeah. just the mere fact that my parents had these two enormous bookshelves on either side of the fireplace in our living room, and that you could look at any book you wanted to. And, you know, so I was that weird little kid who, you know, there was a collection of cartoons from Punch, the British humor magazine mm -hmm. that I yeah. poured over. And I just read so chaotically and so randomly. And truthfully, I'm always trying to get back to that kind of reading. Mm. Because it was the happiest reading of just like, this is what I'm going to read right now. And like not thinking about what I should be reading or what I needed yeah. to be reading or, you know, how it just, I, I like to just kind of follow that same cat. And the other thing I'll just say, by the way, um, is I think one of the great things about being the age I am is I'm one of the last people who learned everything I knew about sex from reading books. There was no cable. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I couldn't get into the true dirty movies. There is no, you, you know, there, I learned about sex from books and I think that's fantastic. And I wish it was still the only way because kids would read more. You know, I think yeah. I, I, I don't know a woman alive who read The Other Side of Midnight and can't describe the scene when the heroine sees a condom for the first time approaching her <laughs> in, a, in a motel room or wherever it is. It just, it was a really wholesome way to learn about <laughs> pornography, you know, learn about sex. And sometimes I was like, I was like, we just need to get our kid more dirty books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remind you of that in two years, Laura. Okay. I would rather her read dirty books and watch yeah. weird stuff on the internet. I mean, maybe yeah. you should give her a copy of Forever Amber. Sure, and Lolita, and I, I should just leave Megan's books around the room, too. I mean, Let's not, not go that far. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I'm That's a grandmother. Awesome. I'm going to caution against Megan's books here. <laughs> Maybe Peyton Place. Peyton Place oh, is big Peyton for Place me. Is I, I big oh, my for me. God. Oh, y'all I remember when in. I thought Judy Bloom was racy, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, it was. You Especially cannot forever. read forever. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I remember reading that. That's what was, how I learned. <laughs> what did he name his penis? I can't remember. I know it had a Ralph? name. Ralph. Was it Ralph? Ralph. Ralph. you remember yeah. that? I don't think I read that. It would have been great if it were Jerry. It's <laughs> like a writer's slumber party tonight. I love it so much. This is so great. I okay. just want to. I just want to put someone's bra in the freezer. <laughs> well, we will let you do that on your own time after the show. <laughs> and, um, I just want to thank y'all so much for being here, and to all of you out there, we encourage you to please grab Megan's novel, The Turnout. And Laura's novel, Dream Girl. Um, and how could you not with all that you just heard? Right. Hopefully from our bookseller of the week, Square Books, for 10% off. 
Megan and Laura, thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much this for so joining us. Thank, thank you. you. This was so much fun. This it's could go on a long here. while. I know. I wish it could. I, I wish it could tonight. We could stay up all night. <laughs> we could. <laughs> all right. Get the Ouija like, board. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, ladies. Good Thank night. you. Bye, Good night, everybody. Ladies. Good night. So, everybody, um, stick around. We'll see you in just a minute at the after show and come back next week. Same time, same place as we welcome Darren Kagan and Paula Ferris. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Well, oh my gosh, that's so much fun. That was so fun. They were so great. Oh my gosh. So, fun. so great. I just loved them. Okay, so that was a great show, and I cannot wait to dive in. But first, Christy, we have to see our merch star of the week. We do. Sean, bring up our merch star. Yay! Oh, I love that. that. So this is Sally Keaton. She is our merch star Sally. of the week. And um, for those of you who do not know, um, our merch star of the week, just you submit a photo of you with your favorite Friends of Fiction merch for a chance to be our merch star of the week. Um, this week, Sally has won a copy of Kristen's The Forest of Vanishing Stars. So send that right out. Yes. Yeah, so um, I will get Sally's address to you, Kristen, and we'll get that right out to her. But thank you, Sally, for being so supportive. And thanks to all of you um, for rocking your Friends in Fiction merch. We love it. And it makes us feel like we're just right there with you. So we Oh, my really gosh. And, and that shirt looks so good on her. I loved that. It does. Yeah, it's so yeah. cute. I yeah, love it. rocking that shirt and nice. and yeah. there she goes. Look at that. Oh, hi, Zippy. I love that shirt though. It's yeah. so soft yeah. and snuggly. I, I wear mine all I the time. Know. Well, you know what? I, I like that she's modeling it for us though, because like when we when we've worn it on the air, you really mm -hmm. only see it from like here up, right? Yeah. Unless and we go hard. like this. Well, right, right, right. But, but then, but then it's never only a great excited. angle. That's, it's never a good honest. idea. No, it's <laughs> not. It's not. But I, I also feel like with a white shirt, there's that perception that like, oh, well, it might be see-through. And it's really not. It's not a see-through. Yeah. It's like a very thick cotton. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I like that we can see that from that picture. That's good. It's a, awesome. it's a really good shirt. I agree. There, I mean, you guys, Sally rocked it. That's why she was the merch star. I mean, it's some hard decisions. <laughs> hard decisions. Um, you there, got order yes order that merch we want you to order that merch yeah, right merch it up and there is a yeah. place on facebook where you can drop your pictures or you can just get them to me i've had people dm them to me and facebook message them to me and email them to me and whatever so so we get another one next week we get another we get, merch oh yeah next. we get another one next week um okay. next week can um, i enter you you can patty okay. you absolutely can well <laughs> you, you can can't enter. Win. we're not giving you a prize patty you, well you can enter to win a copy of the nice. santa suit because um, Ooh, as far as I, I haven't know, gotten one, Kristen so. is the only one who has received the copy. Why is so that? Far. What's happening? Because I'm so special. No, so special. I don't. She did. She did something, and I <laughs> sent her one. No, what happened? Um, she did really something. Can you tell us what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I feel um, so slighted. You know, all part, part of the supply chain problems that are really real. Mm -hmm. No, they're real. <laughs> This no, fall are, is real. that printers only have so much capacity. Yeah, so it's crazy. they sent me. Usually, I get like a couple of cases of mm -hmm. advanced readers copies, which mm -hmm. is an arc, mm -hmm. and I only got like one. Um, mm -hmm. So we will have finished copies mm -hmm. soon. Ooh, so I should hurry up and put this one on eBay. I was yeah, so make, basically make what, I, what you're saying is you only it got be a case, traveling. and when choosing between your three friends on the screen. You chose Kristen. <laughs> but did you no, hear what I she thought... said? She said Kristen did something. Mm -hmm. She said Kristen. I, I thought I was gonna something. get I thought I was gonna get, you know, another case of arcs. And then they said, excuse me, my hair is y'all, I'm gonna get clipped and dipped on Saturday, and I'm so grateful for that. But yeah, um, and so the point is that if you want our books this mm -hmm. fall, merch star, we merch hope star. you will want them. Really pre-ordering, oh, pre hmm. pre-ordering yeah. with these printing problems. Pre yeah. pre -ordering. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, because we've that's had stock true. problems in the past because mm -hmm. of the printer Gosh. delays. So yeah, oh, if, if you want it, make have. sure you're getting it on 
on publication mm-hmm. day. That's such a good point. Pre-ordering mm-hmm. is so important. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about Megan and Laura for a second because you can tell they're friends. And yeah. and Kathy, I'm, Mary Kay, I know you've known Laura for a yeah. while, but they both write such twisty, turny right. things. Mm-hmm. And they're both just like adorable. so charming and smart mm-hmm. and adorable and good. and good to their core. Yep. <laughs> and good to the core. And they're able yep. to tap into these mm-hmm. horrible people. I liked mm-hmm. that question about how to yeah. do that. I liked that too. I thought that was a great question. Uh, yeah. What I love about Megan is that she really, I think, has like an insight into estrogen fueled teenage girls mm. oh interesting because it's the turnout it's mm-hmm. uh, the cheerleading the cheerleaders uh yeah. the gymnasts yeah. what was that yeah. one mm-hmm. and she really gets what happens mm-hmm. yeah. when you know that collides mm-hmm. yeah and and I think what's interesting, I mean, I don't even know if she has, if Megan has Meg children. Just, Meg just said, and she doesn't even have kids and she's never been a competitive athlete. So she's what? tapping into something other oh. at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I write about murder and I've never killed anyone. Well, it's true. You but, say, but you know you what? Say. I actually think motherhood in particular, like I think maybe that's the wrong phrase, but I think writing about kids sometimes, like sometimes I think when you're reading, you're like, they're writing, you know, like you can tell that a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like a real, I don't know. Right. And, and the th- I th- what I love about um, Laura's writing is because we've been, as I say, we've been friends. We were with the same house for a long time is I love the way her writing, um, she doesn't stay the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the secret to the success of a good writer is, that you always you're trying to do better with every book you're trying to do something different um and she is not afraid to go dark no yeah no i really i mean i said it like 10 times on the show but i really could not get over just the person that her protagonist ended up being versus who like i thought he was going to be and it's like in his head it's not only just that he thinks like la la like he really thinks that like he's had this kind of boring life like he's sort of like I think it's so ho hum. I don't know. I really wanted to ask Megan and, and didn't get to, but I really wanted to ask her what that moment was like when she found out she was a Jenna pick. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let let's see if maybe all four of us can find out what that feels like. Let's do. And like, it. Hello, let's do. Jenna. Yes, Jenna, if you're listening, or Reese. we want to know oh, what that feels like. <laughs> we we really can't explain it until we've experienced it firsthand. Right. So, and if we try know, to write about yeah. it, people will know that we're making it up. Don't, don't know. <laughs> you know, it would just help if you picked each of us for for mm-hmm. upcoming months. Yeah, I think it would be so interesting tonight. I was thinking about all these books. Um, it's. I don't know if it's a recent phenomenon, but there are a lot of books that are written about writers. Yeah, yeah. The past yeah. four or five years, and uh, and and I think it's so interesting because when we're doing the work, I mean, what's more boring than what we do? Yeah, yeah. And yet, right. what's yeah. more exciting, right? So, if you're watching us, this is what we're doing. Yeah, right. <laughs> In here, right. And then, then in the community, the and then in, and then we're doing this, checking our Amazon ranking. Yes, texting each texting other, each other about things. Yes, <laughs> about our and each other's. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you're right on the outside, but I, I, that's why I've always loved that quote that says, um, "Writing might not be the best way to make a living, but it's a damn good way to make a life." Because yeah. although it might look boring or it might not yeah. pay all the bills, it's it's so exciting mm-hmm. in yeah, there. It's a beautiful yeah. life. Yeah. Well, it's not a bad thing when you wake up at 5:45 in the morning <laughs> and you're like, okay, I, I have an idea for a paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Or or sometimes I wake up all night long trying to think of the word. And I think uh, it starts with an E. It starts with an E. And <laughs> I know, I know. I, I nudge my husband, who's like in mid snore, and I'm like, what's that, word? "What's that word when you steal from 
the company that you work for. Embezzlement. <laughs> Embezzlement. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a different word from extortion. Extortion is kind of like embezzlement, but it's a different thing. Yeah, but not exactly. Yeah. True, true. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. It's so hilarious. Your head is always working, always on plot. <laughs> well, don't always you figure it out. Don't you ladies wake up? I mean, oh my maybe. gosh. What I tell myself, and we all do this before I go to sleep, I need to figure this out. But the worst part is if I start thinking about it before I fall asleep. Oh, because terrible. then and you can't, I forget it. I can't sleep, well, I, I I can't like, sleep. Yeah. if I if I'm thinking about yeah. something plot related, I, I'm just up. Like there's I, yeah. it's like hours I before I can fall asleep. Tell myself you can dream about it and think about it in the morning, yeah. but you cannot think about that plot no. twist uh -uh. right now. I did it the other night and I finally just got up and was like, all right, I'm just going to write because I can't, yeah. I mean, it was like night before last or something. And Elvid Will Awake, who was mid store and said, you're going to have to take Will to school in the morning and he's taking his lunch. <laughs> he was oh, like, wow. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Which you will be making him. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Cause you know, you just knew, I mean, that was it. It was over. Yeah. It was like already midnight and I was like, well, there's no way I'm going to, I'm just before. getting up. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna do, do it. it. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. those, I when I look back, though, sometimes those are like the very best parts of the story, the ones that yeah. just like won't let you go. Won't let you go. I, I have no good ideas past about seven p.m. Just for the record, like. But see, you're a real no, morning person. I am like, a morning person. I just I'm have like an opposite nap. rhythm. Like when you guys are yeah. texting up a storm at six forty-five, I'm like, oh my god, I can't even. Get my eye open. <laughs> well, let's not. Oh, no, I mean, I have to be awake, so it's not like you're waking me up. But I'm just like, God, they're so on. What is wrong with me? <laughs> We're flipped. Let's We're not flipped. forget that half of us are empty nesters yeah. and don't have to get children off to school. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, we have that freedom in the morning. I mean, I. I will give myself an assignment before I fall asleep at night. Yeah, you do. You're good about that. But um, then I have the midday slump. So I take a nap on the sofa in the sunroom. Oh, well, speaking so of the midday that slump, so dreamy. I think we're all like, probably going to have the no dinner slump in just yep, a minute. You're right. You're right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. A delicious. What are y'all having for dinner? I, I'm going to have a delicious grilled cheese. Are oh, you Kirsten's out of wine. We have to go. Yeah. <laughs> Jason made Jason made tuna pokey, which I'm so excited oh about. Oh my he gosh, this awesome is tuna so pokey good. with macadamia nuts and green onions mm. is so good. Sesame seeds, it's yeah. delicious. Oh my good. gosh, that sounds mm -hmm. amazing. Probably better than my crackers and cheese. Mm. But anyway, I sometimes I forget when we're doing this that we're on a screen. So I know we're no. not just talking. <laughs> no, we're not just talking. <laughs> We miss you all. Later. Love you all. I know. Good night, everybody too. out there. Good night, everyone. Talk to you. 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 Talk to you.